This morning, we're, as I mentioned before, we're looking at a couple of verses in um, 2 Corinthians 3, verses, uh, well, the last two verses of the chapter, verses 17 and 18, but to understand those two verses, we do need to read um, the whole chapter. And to understand those two verses, we also need to understand what the chapter is actually saying, which means the introduction to the two points I want us to see this morning is going to be half the, the sermon. So I don't want you to think that we're just sort of wasting time. I, you know, I hope we never think we're doing that in the introduction, okay? But the introduction is very informative as well. So don't just say, well, this is the introduction, this is the introduction, we're waiting for the points and so forth. Let's try to get what we can from this chapter, from the introduction, as well as the, the points that we're going to see in, in those two verses. So let's begin, though, by reading 2 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. I do want to draw your attention to the similarity between this and Jeremiah 31, and what the author to the Hebrews says is the blessing of the new covenant. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. For if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Now, I know some of you have read this chapter before and have probably been trying to figure out what it means, and we're not going to be able to look at everything it has to say, but I do want to point out the things in it that have to do with the two verses we're looking at at the end. So we're going to focus on those particular uh, elements. And I believe what the Apostle Paul is pointing us to here is really the greatest difference between the Old and the New Covenants. Basically, as I said, the same thing the author to the Hebrews points to in his book. Now, it's not so much the shadowy nature of the Old Covenant, the fact that... Um, the Old Covenant was shadows, uh, prophecies, and promises, whereas in the New Covenant you have a clear revelation, not only that the Old Covenant was pointing to the fulfillment of these things and the New Covenant itself is fulfillment, but really it's the results of that fulfillment in the coming of Jesus Christ. The glory of the New Covenant 
versus that of the old, to what God actually provides in the new, which was lacking in the old, and that is the work of the Spirit in the heart. Now, again, that can raise some different questions. Perhaps those will be answered as we go on, but let me just quote the author to the Hebrews who's quoting Jeremiah 31, telling us the difference between the Old and New Covenant and see if this isn't where he locates the difference. He said, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I do want you to just, re I'll just say this quickly because just the possibility, well, we don't want to misunderstand. This covenant that God made with Israel was not just with Israel. This new covenant is not just with Israel. It is also with everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I remind you, Gentiles used to be far off, used to be strangers and aliens to the covenants of God, without God and without hope in the world. But through Jesus Christ, those who are far off have been brought near, no longer strangers, no longer aliens, but now fellow citizens with the saints. So this isn't just talking about what God was going to do with Israel, though it is primarily for the Jews, and there were many Jews who received it, but there were also many who rejected it, and when they did, He turned to the Gentiles that they might also be grafted in, contrary to nature, to that covenant that God made with Abraham. Now, I want you to notice this, though, that in the Old Covenant, God gave the Jews His law written on stone tablets. Now, having that law was a great blessing to them, obviously, because it told them how they could please God, how they could please Him by loving Him, how they could please Him by loving their neighbor. But we're pointed to the fact that that law was by itself not enough. It could show them what was right and what was good, but it could not give them the power to keep it, and they needed that power because of the sinfulness of their hearts. It did, however, highlight the problem, which was their sin and what their sin actually deserved. The wages of sin is death. Now, here is why Paul calls the Old Covenant a ministry of death, a ministry of condemnation, because if you have the law but yet you're unwilling to keep the law, it can't save you. It can only condemn you. By the way, that's the same condition we came into the world. You and I were also like this apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from His mercy. We might have known the law of God. We might have even had Bibles in our homes. You know, the Gideons do a good job of distributing Bibles and perhaps, you know, we had from somebody in the family who was a Christian perhaps a Bible, but if you have the Bible and you don't read it, if you have the Bible and you read it and you don't keep it, you don't trust Jesus Christ, it's not going to do you any good. It's going to do you, actually it can do you some harm if you never trust Jesus because it would be better not to have known than to know and not trust Him. Well, the same thing with regard to the Jews. They knew what God wanted, but for the most part, they didn't keep it, and that's the condition that we were in. But God showed mercy. That's what the Old Testament was pointing to. The Old Covenant was pointing to was God's mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. They couldn't keep the law of God, but Jesus could. God sent His Son into the world to obey. God sent His Son into the world to die, to provide that perfect obedience, that perfect righteousness, and to make a, a payment for sin, the only payment that the Father could accept because the only one of infinite value so that... God could send His Spirit into the world to give the power to trust Jesus and to obey. Remember, we've already seen, apart from Him, we can't. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, you know this blessing. 
God has taken His law from, as it were, the same law written on stone tablets. This is one of the reasons why we believe the law of God, the Ten Commandments, are still something we need to pay attention to, love, and submit to today is because it's that law that was written on the stone tablets, which are the Ten Commandments, that the Spirit of God takes and He puts in your minds and He writes upon the fleshly tablets of your heart. What does that mean? It means by His Spirit, He has opened your eyes to see the beauty of that law, to see the beauty of Jesus Christ, to see the beauty of holiness. That's the same thing that's referred to in the Bible as the breaking of the stony heart and giving you a heart of flesh so that you now love the things you used to hate. Stony heart refers to that hatred that Paul was referring to in Romans chapter 8 where we didn't want to submit to the law of God because we hated it. Well, he changes that by his Spirit and opens our eyes to see the beauty and the glory of it so that your heart is drawn out to it and you keep it. I mean, primarily, it's trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, turning from your sins, but repentance means obedience. But this is what it means to be spiritually alive. You were once dead, but now you're spiritually alive. The Spirit of God has given you this great love, and He's opened your eyes to see these things. Now, let me just back up for a moment and ask this question. Since Paul represents the Old Covenant as a covenant written on stone that could only condemn a ministry of death, a ministry of condemnation, does that mean no one in the Old Covenant was saved? No, there were people who were saved, obviously. I mean, we just read about David and his love for the Lord. But they weren't saved by the the commandments written on stone. At least they weren't directly because God never gave a law that could actually give you life. That wasn't the purpose of the commandments in the first place. They were actually meant to convict you of your sin to show you that you couldn't be good enough to be acceptable by God. That's why God gave them to drive them to the one God had promised in the covenant He had made before that covenant, which is the covenant He made with Abraham. Remember, He promised Abraham that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Paul says in Galatians that the Mosaic Covenant was basically put on top of the promise. It was added to the promise and it was meant to teach them their need of Christ. It was meant to convict them of their need of Christ and to drive them to the one He had promised in the Abrahamic Covenant. And that is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who actually saw Him in the ceremonies, saw Him in the priesthood, saw Him in the sacrifices, who saw their need of Him, Uh, were were, uh, they they saw Jesus Christ. They trusted in the one who was coming. And those who trusted in him were saved in the same way we are and given really the same blessing, although in the new covenant it's much clearer, much fuller. Now, Paul goes on to tell us that because the law written on stone couldn't save, because the old covenant couldn't save, that there were indications in the old covenant that one day the covenant was going to be replaced by a better covenant, one which was much more glorious, so much so that the other one would have no glory in comparison. In our passage, he points to an account given in Exodus 34 where we read that Moses, that his face, when he spent time with the Lord on Mount Sinai receiving the commandments, when he would spend time with the Lord in the tent of meeting, when he would come out from the presence of the Lord, his face would shine. And he wasn't even aware of it, but the people of Israel saw it, and they were afraid. They were afraid to look at him. When Moses realized that, he covered his face with a veil. Now, Paul tells us that that veil actually had two other purposes besides uh, taking care of of the, the fear that the Israelites had. The first was to keep them from seeing this glory which was fading away. Uh, he, he didn't continue to shine throughout his life when he was spent time away from the presence of the Lord. The glory would fade. Well, that was a picture of the fading glory of the old covenant that was going to make room for the surpassing glory of the new covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that was the first reason why Moses veiled his face. But the second was to show them their own condition apart from Jesus Christ, their spiritual condition. The veil also pictured the blindness of their hearts. 
the sin that kept them that kept the Jews of Moses' day from actually seeing the glory of Jesus Christ in these types and shadows of the Old Covenant and trusting in Him and being saved. Paul says the same thing was true of the Jews of his day. They also had their hearts veiled, their faces veiled to the glory of the Lord. They did not see the glory of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the veil was to picture the, the, well, it was to keep them from seeing the glory that was fading away that that covenant was going to be done away with, a better covenant was coming, but it also represents the blindness of the hearts of those who have not trusted Jesus Christ. Now, that is the same veil that lies over the hearts of everyone who either hasn't heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ or has heard it but has not really trusted Him. But again, here is the surpassing glory of the new covenant that through the gospel, God takes away that veil and He opens the eyes to behold the glory of Jesus Christ by His Holy Spirit and by that same Spirit to transform you into His image from one level of glory to the next to free you from sin so that you may follow Jesus Christ. I've actually covered the whole chapter already, but I want to back up now and deal with those two points that are in verses 17 and 18. I want us to consider that transformation that the Lord works in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit, and I want us to see two things in particular which are really just flip sides of the same. That in the new covenant, which again, the Lord is able through that covenant to do what the old covenant can do, what is it He does? First, He sets you free from sin. And secondly, He transforms you into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, in the new covenant, the Lord sets you free from sin by His Holy Spirit. Look at verse 17. Paul writes, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, let me just mention in passing First of all, that this is a very clear statement of the deity of the Holy Spirit. Notice that the Lord is the Spirit, that this title of Lord applies just as much to Him as it does to the Father and the Son. There's, there's, again, just want you to get that because there's always some around who are saying the Spirit of God isn't personal, the Spirit of God is not God. Uh, there are those who believe in Jesus only, but we do need to make sure we, we see the distinction here. The Spirit is a separate person, and He is a divine person. But moving on from that, I want you to notice this. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, we need to ask the question, liberty from what? Liberty from the law, the, the law of condemnation that could only kill us? Well, that's what a lot of Evangelical churches tend to think and believe today, but that's obviously not what it's saying because that is the law the Spirit of God writes on our hearts. This is not freedom from the law. This is not freedom from obedience, but it's rather freedom from what would have destroyed you, what would have condemned you, and that is disobedience, freedom from sin. The Bible says you were the prisoner of sin when you came into the world, and you were because of Adam's sin. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Through one man, sin entered into the world, Adam, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, Paul's not saying here that like Adam, we all sinned and so we came under the condemnation that Adam came under. What he's saying here is in Adam's one sin, all of us sinned. Adam was our representative and his sin became our sin. That's why we read in verse 18 of Romans chapter 5, through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. I want to draw your attention, too, to the fact that in the Bible, Paul makes a parallel between what Adam did and what Jesus did. And whereas the people that Adam represented were all condemned, the people that our Lord Jesus Christ represents, those who actually trust in Him and turn from their sins, they are all saved by what He did. Adam sinned and He condemned all of those He represented. Jesus obeyed and He saved all of those 
whom he represents, which are those who trust in him. Now, one sin was all that was needed to kill your soul. That's why you came into the world spiritually dead. Again, David writes in Psalm 51, he was conceived in sin. You know, that's the way he came into the world, not because his mother sinned, in sin he was conceived, but rather it was because he was a child of Adam. Now, that's why you came into the world spiritually dead as well. That's why you were the captive of sin, as Paul writes to the Ephesians. I mean, listen to what he says here, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead. He's writing to the Christians who were, notice past tense, you were dead. But this was their condition prior to Christ. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And notice and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, what is Paul talking about here? He's talking about the same veil that was over the hearts of the Jews then, that was over the hearts of the Jews of his day, that was over their hearts, that kept them from seeing the glory of God and the gospel of seeing Jesus Christ. He's talking about spiritual death, our condition as we came into the world, the veil that darkens the mind and hardens the heart and blinds you to what is really good, that veil of sin, the veil that kept us from seeing God's holiness. That is why we came into the world hating God and hating His law. That's why we ended up in this condition that Paul talked about as we read in Romans chapter 8. The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Why were we in that situation? Well, it's because of Adam's sin. It gave us a sinful disposition because of our own sins as well, because we sinned from that disposition. But you see, in the gospel, here's the good news and here's the glory of the new covenant. God changes that condition by His Holy Spirit. You were dead, but He made you alive, which is what Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. He removed the veil and gave you life, spiritual life. And with that life, He gave you liberty, liberty from sin, from your bondage to sin, from your love for sin. He did that by giving you another principle, the law of the Spirit, to open your eyes, as I've said before, to see the beauty of Jesus Christ so that you would desire Him as your Savior and trust Him and want to walk with Him in obedience. All He had to do was give you the Spirit to take away that veil, to free you from your sins, to change the whole direction of your life. That's all He needed to do. As I mentioned before, that's the only difference between the believer and the unbeliever is the Spirit of God in your heart. Now, He did change the direction of your life, but as I mentioned before as well, that doesn't mean you're never going to sin again. wish it were the case, but it isn't. You will actually sin against the Lord every day. And it's not because you're going to be overtly breaking His law and doing great sins every day. That's not what I mean by that. But what it means is everything that you will be, you'll, you'll do, even the things that you do in obedience to His commandments, are going to be imperfect they're going to have the imperfections of self-glorification, of self-love mixed in them rather than a pure love and desire for God's glory and His honor. Again, even the unconverted person can at least give the outward form of obedience. They can do what God requires at least by the letter of the law, but they cannot keep the spirit of the law 
which is love towards God and love towards their neighbor because we've already seen they're in the flesh. They cannot please God. They cannot submit to God because they hate Him. That is how the Bible characterizes unconverted men. But again, getting back to us, the fact that God gives us a spirit does not mean you're never going to sin again. You are going to, but you're still going to have the imperfections of sin. As John reminds us in 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We will have those imperfections, but the difference is, of course, you want to be perfect and you'll be striving for perfection and you will be growing in perfection by God's grace. You'll be making progress towards that goal. Now, that brings us to the second point. In the new covenant, the Spirit of God is the one doing this. He's the one transforming you into the image of Jesus Christ. That is His work. That is His goal. That is His purpose for being in you. He doesn't leave you by God's grace as He found you. He doesn't just set you free, on the other hand, to choose your own direction. Really, there isn't any other direction if He's going to set you free from sin because everything other than what He wants us to do to become like Jesus Christ is sin. He works to make you more like Jesus. Again, verse 18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Now, what's Paul talking about here? What is this mirror that he is referring to? I think what he means is that while you're here on earth, you're not going to be able to see Jesus Christ face to face, right? I mean, He's not here on earth, but that doesn't mean you can't see Him at all. You can see Him in Scripture. You can see Him in the gospel when you read the Bible. You see, when you read the Bible, the Spirit reveals Christ to you. He shows you what He is like. He shows you His glory. He shows you how good He is. He shows you what He does, what His heart is like, what His mind is like, what He's all about. And as He does this, He makes you want to become more like Him. By the way, that's one of the reasons why we were going through this series in the first place. We wanted to look at Jesus and see what He was like so that the Spirit could show you His glory and draw your heart out to want to become more like Him. I mean, sometimes we, we, we read the Bible, we look at what Jesus did, and we say, well, Jesus did all these things for me, and because He did these things, I'm saved. And that's as far as we go sometimes with Jesus. But we need to examine His life and see what He's like, because that is the image the Spirit of God is seeking to work into your heart. You need to see what He's doing as well, because that's what He wants you to do. He wants you to live that life. He wants you even to lay down your life if He calls you to do that. But every day, you see, He may call you to lay down your life for Him, uh, literally, die for Him. But He certainly wants you to lay it down every day to pick up your cross and follow after Him. Die to yourself and do His work. Now, what have we seen so far that Jesus is like? What is this image that we're being transformed into? Well, we've seen, these are the things, this is my opportunity to review quickly what we have seen. We've seen that it was important to Him, more important to Him, to honor His Father and to do His work than meeting His basic needs of even eating and drinking. He said to His disciples in the case of the Samaritan woman, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. That's what Jesus was like. That was more important than even his necessary food. We saw that Jesus loved other people and He treated them the way that He wanted to be treated. In other words, He loved them the way He wanted to be loved. We saw that Jesus Christ didn't come into the world to have other people serve Him, but rather He came to serve others. We read that He resisted temptation even to gain the things that his father had promised him, the kingdoms of the world, the, to, to show the Jews that he was the Messiah, uh, the, the ways that Satan suggested, remember, in his temptation, 
actually had the goal of what Jesus came into the world to, to gain those kingdoms. He used to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, and to show the Jews that He was the Messiah, just cast yourself off the pinnacle of the temple and, and the angels, when they catch you, the Jews will see that you're the Messiah. What He was suggesting Jesus do, the end was good, but the means, fall down and worship me, get up on the temple and throw yourself off, the means were wrong. And so Jesus resisted temptation, even the temptation to get the right things in the wrong way. So the means to the end, you see, the ends don't justify the means. The means have to be what God requires as well as the ends. Jesus obeyed His Father. We saw that Jesus was zealous for His Father's worship and honor. And when He saw His Father dishonored in the temple by all the, you know, the buying and selling that was going on, Jesus cleansed the temple. He did what was necessary to restore the honor of His Father. We saw that Jesus had compassion on the lost, and He reached out to them with the gospel, and that He was even willing to suffer in doing that. He suffered even death on the cross and the curse of our sins on the cross, but that was, of course, the Father's plan. We saw that He lived every day in the presence of God, always being aware of the fact that the Father was with Him. And he always did exactly what the Father called him to do. He didn't just give him a general obedience. He knew precisely what his Father wanted, and he did exactly that without varying even one degree. Every variance from what the Lord calls us to do is, in fact, sin. And Jesus was sinless. We saw that He didn't seek for the pleasures of this world or the glory of this world, but rather He fixed His eyes on the glory and the holy pleasures that were ahead in the world to come. Author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 too, for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, these, among other things, this is what the Spirit of God is working in you if you know Jesus Christ, His image, what He is like, that is what He wants for you. It doesn't mean He always gets it, of course, because we're resisting Him. The flesh, the, the corruption that's still inside of us, the sin, is fighting against Him. Paul talks about how these two were at war with one another so that we often times may not do what we please and we can never do it exactly the way we want to do it because our flesh resists us. But Paul takes that into account in our text because I want you to notice that the Spirit of God doesn't do this all in one step. It'd be nice if He did. But that's not God's will because He wants to teach us to rely on Him and His strength more. This is something that is being done step by step from one level of glory, one level of holiness, one level of likeness to Christ to the next. It's something that is done, we might say, little by little, but one day He will make you just like Him when you see His face in heaven. Now, this is what the Spirit of God does. This is what He does in the heart and in the life of every single believer. This is how you can really know that you have come to know Jesus Christ in a saving way and that you just haven't prayed a prayer that had no meaning that wasn't meant, there's no transformation. Do you see Jesus being formed in you? You see, that's the only way you can know that you are a believer. And so let's make that the applicational question this morning. Is that what the Spirit of God is doing in your life? Are you becoming more like Jesus? Has He set you free from bondage to sin? Love for sin. When He does that, you see, you don't have to give in anymore. You don't have to yield your members as the instruments of unrighteousness. Now you can do what the Lord calls you to do. Has He removed the veil from your eyes and given you eyes to see the beauty of the holiness of Jesus Christ? Do you see your life being transformed into His image? Are you walking with Him in holiness? And is it something that goes beyond just what you see? Do other people see that same transformation? Do they see Jesus being formed in you? So that they either ask you what's going on or hate you because they hated Christ. You know, when you 
behave like Jesus, people that hate Jesus are going to hate you as well. Do you suffer that hatred from others? Or do you have people coming and asking you, what is the difference in your life? Your being like Jesus Christ is going to draw some and it's going to offend others. Is, is that what's happening? Well, if, if not, that likely is the case that Jesus isn't being formed in you. And if that is the case, then you need to come to Jesus. He's the only one that can remove that veil that covers your heart. Take away that blindness. Jesus gave sight to the blind. That was something that was unique to His ministry. But what He did in the physical realm, He does in the spiritual realm as well. He can remove the blindness, the spiritual blindness, and give you eyes to see. He can show you His glory by His Holy Spirit who can give you a new heart and transform you into His image. But only He can do this. You see, you need to repent. You need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to turn away from this sinful world if you're going to be saved. But Jesus alone can give you that power to do that, which is why you need to come to Him and trust Him and take hold of Him for that work of His grace. He's the only one who can bring you to heaven. We're talking about, you know, bondage to sin, Spirit sets you free. Why does it matter? Well, because if the Spirit of God doesn't set you free from your bondage to sin and you continue to sin and you hate God and you don't submit to His laws and you don't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to end up being punished for all your sins forever in hell. That's why it matters. If you don't turn to Christ, you'll be condemned. But Jesus alone can take away that veil. He alone can transform your life. He alone can give you His Holy Spirit. So you need to come to Him. If Jesus isn't being formed in you, you're in danger. You need to come to Christ. You need to ask Him for His mercy. And He is merciful. The Lord says, and those that come to Him, He will not cast out. So come to Jesus and receive His mercy and His grace as He offers it to you in the gospel. And He will transform you and He will bring you safely to heaven. He will save you. Well, let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard this morning and apply it to us as we need to hear it, even in ways perhaps we don't think we need to hear it. Let's ask that the Lord would show us our needs and help us respond as we, as we need to.